Let's worship the Lord together. Those who trust in the Lord are a strong mountain, they will not, not be moved. Let's sing that again together. Those who trust in the Lord are a strong mountain. be moved though the world moves like mad though the world moves like mad you alone are faithful but jesus you you will not not be changed those who trust in the lord are a strong mountain they will not not be moved let's let, learn that verse again together those who trust in the lord are a strong mountain they will not not be moved let's sing the chorus together Though the world moves like mad, you alone are faithful. Jesus, you will not, not be changed. Christ the King, beneath my feet, on a firm foundation, they will not. Those who trust in the Lord are as Mount Zion. They will not, not be moved. Though the world moves like mad, you alone are faithful. Jesus, you. Keep those hands flapping. Let's sing that chorus again. Though the world moves like mad, you alone are faithful. Our Lord is a faithful, faithful God. He, he does not change yesterday, today, tomorrow. He is always the same. And together we come, we worship him, and we're having trouble with the words, aren't we? So we're going we're gonna to come back here. we got a new little station back here, and he's going to take over manually. But we are, even though things may fail us, <laughs> even though we may fail you, our God is a faithful God. Amen. And that really is what where it boils down to. We're going to mess things up. We're going to mess things up in our lives. But yet God is faithful. He is always there with us. And so that's, that's what helps us get up each and every morning. Because he, he never changes and he is a holy, holy, holy God. And so we're going to keep worshiping him. We're going to just set our eyes upon the Lord. So let's do this together. <laughs> Thank you. 
use the hand clapper too if you want. Here we go. Holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Sing it again. those hands clapping. Eternity is going to be wonderful and that we are going to be able to sing praises to our God and it is going to be right. There's going to be no resistance whatsoever. Our God is a holy, holy, pure God. So let's sing this one more time. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
let's hear it for the Lord that he is such a great and mighty God. For his love never fails, it never gives up, and it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love your love let's sing that chorus again your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love. Your love. And it's higher than the mountains that I face. And it's higher than the mountains that I face. And it's stronger than the power of the grave. This one thing remains, one thing remains. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. for that and on and on and on and on it goes it overwhelms and satisfies my soul I'm gonna never ever have to be afraid this one thing remains one fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love your love and in death in life i'm confident in death in life Nothing that can separate my heart from your great love in death and life. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My debt is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. That's the drums. Here we go. You love. Never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, and never runs out on me. Your love. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love. Your love. Your love. Your love. our God is such a faithful God, he's always going to want to use us. And if we find that 
that w- the Lord isn't working in our lives, then, then guess who moved? Because God is always there. He's, he's for yesterday, today, tomorrow, he never changes. And he is faithful <coughs> to work through each and every one of us. And all he needs is not our ability, but our availability. And if we just said, yes, Lord, I'm here. <coughs> I'm here. I messed up. I, I trust that you are, are fixing my mistakes. You're fixing me. But here I am, Lord. Use me. And as a church, it's exciting to see families coming together with our hearts intent on serving the Lord and, and making the Lord known throughout our, our community. And it's a tough task. But yet, if we make ourselves available, then he is going to work through us like never before. And it, it's going it's, it's to be so amazing that we can't at all pat ourselves on the back, but we're going to be able to praise God because he is using us because we are available. So we want to teach you this brand new song.
just are available to you. We just want to make ourselves available for you to use us. And in order for us to be available, we need to humble ourselves before your throne. Father, let us be still. Let us be quiet. Let us hear your still, small voice. Direct us as we make ourselves available to you now. Father, open up the eyes of our hearts. Show us the things that you want us to see. It is great to be in your presence, Father. We pray that we are united when we as the a church declare that we are available for you to work in this land through us to this community. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. And as long as you're turning to John 17, would you also put a, a little marker in 1 Corinthians 13? We're going to be also in 1 Corinthians 13, like at the very end of the message. And I just want you to have it available whenever we get there. You know, I, I also noticed that um, I did not charge up my iPad completely, so I'm going to have to preach fast or go to a backup. We'll see what happens here. But I've got a couple options. Thank you, Alex. for Bob t and the worship team to do that song. I heard it this week on Pandora on uh, Elevation Worship Channel. It's, and it got me in tears. <laughs> so I said, they need to be in tears because that song is incredible as far as telling us what we're supposed to be, surrender to the Lord. We're, last week we studied the first half of this prayer. I'm going to fly through that review really quick in case you weren't here, and then we're going to jump what this week is, but verses 1 through 12 is where we got to last week when we talked about Jesus praying for the glory both of his Father and himself. We call it on the outline reciprocal glory. He's asking that if he's glorified, it glorifies the Father. When the Father's glorified, it glorifies the Son is what he's explained to us, and it fills us. He's glorified in the cross, and he's glorified in us. That is probably the highest thing, trait anyone could ever say about anyone is that God's glory is reflected in us. But that's what he says. He says that about every person who comes to know him, it brings him glory. He's also, they're going to be glorified in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection the Father is glorified by the cross. The cross was supposed to be a place of shame. It was supposed to shame those who had done wrong. It was, it was reserved for the most vile of criminals. And yet, when Jesus is crucified, it brings God glory because it accomplishes his purpose for all time. He's also praying for the disciples. They believed because Jesus bore God's name. Jesus carried God's name. He manifested it. 
He made sure that the world could see God through him bodily walking and talking and healing and loving and teaching. Everything Jesus did was purposeful. Everything he did was designed for us to see who God is. It's the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament is what Jesus is. And he also wanted them to be kept in his name. We talked a great deal about this, but what that means is, is that the, the commandment in the Old Testament that, that it says that we're not to take the name of the Lord in vain is not talking necessarily about cussing. It is talking about how we represent God's name. You know, the worst thing you can have is, I thought you were a Christian. <laughs> Somebody saying that to us because of something they saw us do or heard us say or the way we acted. That's the worst thing, isn't it? Because we bear his name. And so we're supposed to be representatives of him. The same way he was a representative of the Father, we're now his representatives on the earth. So we have to... Keep in mind that at all times that we're bearing his name. And we're, lastly, I talked about how we're kept. And what I was sharing there is that God seals you with the Holy Spirit of God. If you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he begins a work in you that isn't completed until the day that you meet him face to face. He's done some things in you that are pretty much unalterable. But there are those who may look and sound and feel and act as if they are believers. And at one time, when things get hard in their life or they're opposed or there's something else that happens, they fall away. How are we to think about those? Well, God does not let go of his grip. My favorite is John 10, where it talks about my sheep hear my voice. I have them in my hand. My father has me in his hand. No one can snatch them out of my hand. That's pretty, I mean, that's pretty blatant. I think that's pretty sealed up. You can't get out of there. Even if you want to, I've heard somebody say that to me one time. Well, that doesn't mean we can't do it. <laughs> I go, it says no one. <laughs> that means you. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. We're sealed when we put our faith in Christ, but there are those who are possibly among us from time to time, who may look, act, smell, f talk, walk, act like they know the Lord, but they may never have known him. Because the scripture tells us if they walk away, they never were of us. Well, I'm going to jump ahead to verse 13. We're starting there today. Verse 13, let's read it just the one verse together of chapter 17 of John. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in the midst. That's a big deal. When he's talking about this joy, he's talking about something that overwhelms us. It's not something that just we get a feeling in a worship service. It's it's about having euphoria well up inside your soul and sustain you. You can have joy at a funeral of someone you love. You can have joy after you've been bankrupted. You can have joy after a massive breakup of a relationship. Joy transcends circumstances. You see, we usually think of joy in the same category as happiness, but they're two totally separate things. Happiness is dependent on circumstances. You'll see this in people's lives because, you know, they go through a class, they get an A, woo, excited, fired up. I got the final, I, I, I aced it. We're fired up. The next day, uh, next class, oh, I got a five on the quiz. <laughs> And what are we? We're down. We're brokenhearted. That's happiness, but that's not joy. Joy is something no one can take from you. No circumstance can take from you. 
Jesus told us in John 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy re may remain in you and your joy may be full. We're kind of addicted to cheap substitutes in America for this. We're addicted to sports or some kind of substance or we're addicted to parties or we're addicted to news. We're addicted maybe to even getting packages delivered to our door every few days. A little piece of joy in that cardboard box every day. And then you open it and you get it. You're all excited, right? Because you're waiting. Hey, when's my package coming? It's coming. Isn't it coming today? Look on your phone. Oh, look, it's coming today. And then it shows up and it gets to your door and you're all excited and you bring it in. You open it up, you pull it out, and you look at it and you go, ooh, that's cool. And then you forget all about it. <laughs> I mean, what good's it doing you in three or four? I mean, it might be something useful that you're using, but usually the joy is gone very quickly i got a verse there for all of us it's isaiah 55 2 why do we spend money for what is not bread and our wages for what does not satisfy listen carefully to me and eat what is good let your soul delight itself in abundance he's telling them they're, they're settling for cheap substitutes for the real thing the real thing only comes through Christ. Only. There's no other place to get it. I'm, I'm speaking as someone who's tried stuff. It doesn't work. It, it, it doesn't satisfy. You get a momentary high from something and it's gone. So the only place that joy comes and stays and abides is in Christ. It's the only place. He says to these disciples, understand that he's leaving and they're going to undergo persecution for believing in him. And he's saying, I want you to have your joy full. Joy in the New Testament is the word kara. It occurs 60 times, 60 times in the New Testament. In its verb form, it exists an additional 72 times. It's a very used word in the New Testament. It's used as a greeting, joy to you. He'll say, or rejoice, I rejoice. That it's being used that time all the time. But the way we see it probably the best is in the book of Acts. You guys know Philippians is the joy book. Paul uses that word more in Philippians than in any other one book. It is like packed in there. Joy is all over the place or rejoice all over the place in Philippians. You know why Philippians is Philippians, don't you? Paul and Silas were arrested in Philippi. They were thrown in. They were beaten with rods until they're bleeding and they have open wounds. They're placed in a jail in chains. The jail is putrid. It stinks. It's awful. What do they do? They start singing praises. Because <laughs> they had joy. That joy changed that town <laughs> forever. It changed it. Because the jailer comes in thinking he's got to kill himself. Their chains are all loose. There's an earthquake. Their chains break loose. The jailer comes in. He, and Paul goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't kill yourself. We're all still here. The jailer turns to them and says, what do I have to do to be saved? The best time for joy is in the worst circumstances. God can supply it. He can give it to you. How does it start on your outline? It starts with faith. He tells us in Philippians 1.25, being confident of this, that I know I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy. And the word of really means that comes from faith. Your faith is what starts the joy train. Without faith, you can't have joy. Your faith that God is who he says, his son is who he says, and that when you put your faith in him, he will keep his promises all the way. 
That's where it starts. Can't have joy without it. It matures, number two, it matures through God's word. The more of God's word you get inside of you that lives in you, your joy begins to mature. Your joy doesn't come as and go as often. It stays more constant in your life. Listen to, listen to the words of the Old Testament because it talks about this. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. Psalm 119, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I'm going to ask you something. If you guys were to walk home today, pull open the door, or you go through your garage, and there, right there in the middle of your living room floor is a pile of gold. You might give a woohoo. <laughs> I don't know, maybe some of you, that's nothing. Nah, nah. <laughs> I would give a woohoo, you know, if there's some gold piled in my, in my living room floor when I get home. Any of you guys want to put some there? Just go ahead. I would get excited about that. But here's what he says. Joy, your statutes give me more joy than if I had all the money in the world. That's what he says. Third thing, it's perfected through obedience. It grows through knowing his word, but it gets perfected through, knowing, through obedience. This is from John 15. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. He's saying it may remain. That means live with you. Every day, all day long, he wants it to live with us. Aren't you tired of the endless cycle of ups and downs in life? Mine is within five minutes, maybe, not even all of life. I can just take five minutes. There's an up and a down in there <laughs> within five minutes. But do you know that we're supposed to take our focus off of this circumstance that we have in our lives and instead focus it on the immutable, unchangeable truths of God? I have to, I have to do that as a mental exercise. I've had to change my mind about my circumstance, or I have the Holy Spirit in the form of my wife who reminds me, why are you like this, Mark? Don't you know that? And she'll remind me, works out really well, that I'm supposed to keep my focus somewhere else other than whatever the circumstance is. You have to do that. You have to change your mind about what's going on in the world and in your life by focusing on these truths, and it will change you, and you can have joy. That song I asked for, because it goes right here in my message, think about this. Are you saying to the Lord when bad circumstances happen, you can have it all? You can have it all. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. You can have it all. You know what? That's, that changes everything, doesn't it? See, because whatever you're going through, he actually owns it. He owns it. He owns our bad circumstances. He owns it. He let it happen for a reason. It may hurt temporarily, but it's happened for a reason. So just surrender to him in the process. Say, God, Whatever you've got for me, here I am. D, on your outline, that they may be kept from the evil one. It's verses 14 through 16, so let's read those together. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Jesus is praying for them to protect them from the dangers that are coming. There are coming dangers. 
There's dangers not only for them, there's dangers coming for each one of us. When their eyes were opened and they were no longer dependent on government or on circumstances or on family or on jobs or anything else that they used to depend on, but then they place their dependence and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ who is immovable and fixed. His word is sure. His promises will come to pass. When they do that, the world automatically hates them. What do you mean? You're not like the rest? You're, good, you're too good for the rest of us? <laughs> the world will hate us for that because they're going through the ocean and the tides are coming and the waves are pounding and they're, they're going up and down with it. It's like we're on a life raft. We've got God sustaining us. They hate us. We can look no further for the world's hatred of God's revealing what happened in Congress. If you're aware of the fact that Congress, and Congress, it would have been the House of Representatives, just passed a bill called the Equality Act. Sounds wonderful, really bad. In the Bible, it tells us in Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his image, in the image of God. He created him. Male and female, he created them. I can't change that. You can't change that. Legislation can't change that. Jesus said it again. Just in case we think, oh, that's Old Testament, that's Genesis. Jesus would never say anything about this subject, would he ever? And he answered and said to them, have you not read? That he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. It's Matthew 19, 4 through 5. Jesus was referring to the, the um, conundrum of divorce, talking about divorce. When the Pharisees were trying to get him to pin him down on a number, is it okay to be divorced or not? And how many divorces can you, can you get a divorce for any reason? That was their big question. And he quoted, this is what he quotes back to them. The act that was passed by the house would not only redefine gen gender from two sexes to an undetermined number, of genders, but it would criminalize any who would speak differently about it. It would strip First Amendment protections from churches. It strips First Amendment protection from free speech to speak about this. It makes it criminal if we speak about it. It would lead to institutions like par Planned Parenthood being in charge of the educational materials given to all schools to re-educate them in a new way. I have a picture of um, the judiciary chairman Jerry Nadler and his quote, when confronted by the scriptures, uh, Representative Greg Stubbe of Florida had warned Congress that if they begin to pass laws that are contrary to the word of God or the will of God, that America will face punishment. This is what Chairman Nadler said. God's will is of no concern of this Congress. Guys, there's not going to be a place that you can go to wait out to wait, wait this thing out. I know right now there's people moving from California and they're going back to my hometown. <laughs> it's a nice, quiet 
place in the middle of the country. Not much happens, not much changes, and people are going to that. They're retreating for safety back in little mid-America somewhere to say, I'm just going to wait this thing out. Let me tell you something. There ain't no safe place to be except for the middle of God's will. That's the safest place you can be. I don't care where you are. It's the safest. You can be in the middle of Iraq or Iran or any other country that may hate Christians. That's the safest place to be. Be in the center of God's will. We can't wait it out. We're meant. What are we supposed to do? Attack the gates of hell. That's, you know that's our job? The gates of hell will not prevail against you, Jesus said. That doesn't mean that they're there to keep you out. That means you're able to knock them down. When we go spread the message of Jesus Christ in our community and the faith that we have, and maybe it's because of persecution and now we're singled out. Now we're an object of ridicule. Maybe we're an object of scorn. Maybe something happens with us. But when we stand firm and say, no, I don't give up Jesus, you can take everything else away from me. But I'm still going to believe in Jesus. People want to know why. And you're going to tell them. Jesus reshapes everything. He changes it all. First thing about that is by being set apart by knowing truth. Look what Jesus says about this in verse are we starting in verse 17? Yes, we are. Look at verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify is a very technical word. It means to consecrate or set apart. It's usually used in context of items that are used in the worship in the temple. So a censer for holding incense that is made to be uh, ignited and have smoke fill the temple is holy. It's consecrated for that work. It's set apart just for that work to be used in the temple. So are all the instruments that priests would use in the, in the work of sacrifice. Every one of them that touched the sacrifices sanctified. They were set apart. But it's also used of people. It's also used about people it's used about god certainly and one cried to the other and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory he's always existed he will always exist he is the creator apart from his creation god is whether we are or not God is whether the planet exists or not. God is. Always has been. Always will be. He's separate from all created things. You've got to understand that and under, to understand who God is. He wants us now to be set apart. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified, that's this word, you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. This is talking about a specific calling to a specific prophet, Jeremiah. But it doesn't just belong to Jeremiah. It belongs to all of us. Because he said, sanctify them by your truth. He now has called each of us to be set apart for the mission of bringing the gospel to the world. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. There are times God wants us to not do things the world does. We talk about that a lot in churches. Usually that's what preachers rail on. <laughs> all the sins we need to not be doing then that's true but it also means we should be doing stuff the world does not do 
And that's loving people who hurt us. That's caring for people that are tough to care for. That's sharing the gospel with the world that is dying without it. That's what we're supposed to be set apart for. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? I took this from the NIV. That's for Nathan, so he knows that I use other versions. By living according to your word, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The word of God is the place you go for, for truth. The world is full of lies because it's controlled by the father of lies. And so it constantly spins lies. I am just amazed in this election cycle how many lies were told. I mean, it went on and on and on. And maybe it's just because I'm super aware and I haven't been paying attention the last 30, 40 years of politics. I'm certain it's begun from the very first race for president. There were a ton of lies told. <laughs> and there were lies always in government. Government always lies, just so you guys know. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying they're all lying every time just when their lips are moving. That's about, that's usually when they're lying. Here's one of the lies that is being told in almost every biology department of every major university and most, ma most high schools today. You are a random piece of protoplasm. They would almost say, oh, you're a miracle that you just got born because you're really a random piece of protoplasm. That's a lie. You were formed in your mother's womb. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. Look at Psalm 139. God says, for I, you formed my inward parts, speaking to God. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Have you ever heard the lie, you don't exist to me. You, you're worthless. You may have heard that in your head. <laughs> you are loved and your heavenly father knows everything about you. In fact, he thinks about you all the time. Look at Psalm 139 again. How precious also are your thoughts to, and the word it could be of or concerning me. That's what it means. Your thoughts directed about me. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Did you know God thinks about you? I'm so glad he's got, like, capacity. I mean, I think I must take up quite a bit. <laughs> but apparently, he's got enough capacity to think about every one of us. You're not worthless. Your father ransomed you with the most precious thing he had. Knowing you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold or from your aimless conduct, Received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. You are loved by God. Well, we're being set apart for a purpose in verses 18 through 19. Let's read this. As you have sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. This is kind of strange that Jesus would say, I sanctify myself. Does he need to be sanctified? He's already holy, isn't he? He's talking about the second meaning of the word where he's set apart for a purpose. He's saying, I've been set apart for a purpose. He's cooperating with the Father in the mission of saving the world. He set himself apart to perform the Father's will to become the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know that in the Old Testament when the, 
when someone would bring a sacrifice for their family, especially when it was a larger animal, what would happen is the priest would lay his hands on the animal's head and on the one who brought the sacrifice. He would pray a prayer that the sins of this man and his family would be laid upon this animal. And they would slaughter that animal and offer it in sacrifice. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God put his hand on his son Jesus on the cross and gave him our sin. He transferred it to Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because he couldn't, he couldn't be there right at that moment that he transferred sin to his son. He dies so we could be set apart. What are our lives supposed to be used for? Isn't there time every one of us thinks, why am I here? What's my purpose? Ask themselves, why do I even live? Let me tell you this story. It's, it, many years ago, a, known speak, uh, a very well-known speaker was preaching at a missions conference. His name is Ralph Kuyper. I don't know if you ever heard of Ralph Kuyper. It's years, years ago. While he was studying in the office, there was a little girl that was eight years old that was attending. They had daily vacation Bible school, if you know what that is, during the summertime. And so she was coming to the little Bible classes every day. And she stopped by, knocked on the doors of the pastor's office, and she said, Mr. Kuyper, and that's the, that's the, he was the pastor, he said, is it all right if I commit suicide? Eight-year-old girl. He was shocked, as you and I would be. So he took a minute. He said, Mary, why would you ever want to commit suicide? He was a young pastor, and this was like the first time he'd ever gone through this. And she said, well, it's because of what I learned in Bible school this morning. Wow, he's thinking, I've got to get with those teachers. But he said, we were, she goes on to say, we were taught that heaven is a wonderful place. No fear, no crying, no fighting. And I, I just want to be with the Lord. Won't that be wonderful? We were taught that when we die, we go straight to Jesus. Did I hear that right? Mr. Kuyper, he says, yes, you did, Mary, but why would you want to commit suicide? Well, she said, you've been in my home. You know my mom and dad. They don't know Jesus. Many times they're drunk, so we have to get ourselves up in the morning, get our own breakfast, and go to school with dirty clothes. The children make fun of us. When we come home, we hear fighting and things that make us afraid. Why shouldn't I commit suicide? Wouldn't heaven be better? She has a point. She was only being practical. But what she was really asking is, why are we in the world anyway? Why not speed up the process and just go immediately to heaven? Kuyper answered by saying, Mary, there's only one reason that we're here in this world. And that's because through our testimony, by life and by word, we may share the love of Jesus with the world. The saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He told her, even then, and gave her a little hope and said it might be possible that your faith in Christ could affect your parents. You know what happened? Years later, her mother gave her heart to Jesus Christ. Partially or mainly because of her daughter's witness to her. That's why we're set apart. I picked up a quote by Carmen Joy Imes, the author of Bearing God's Name, that her parents uses all the time and here's what he said Jesus finished his mission but he left us to finish his work that's good 
That's right. That's what we're supposed to be, is on mission every day. God so loved the world that he what? Sent. He sent. He gave his son. But he sent him. He's sending us too. Jesus says here, I'm sending them out as you've sent me. I send you. In Cabra Con, Guatemala, at one point, this is in a town that is at 9,000 feet elevation. It's always wet and it's always cold and no one wanted to go there to be a pastor. Apparently, this young man hadn't known what was missing him and he decides to go up there and be a pastor. There's a struggling church of 28 people. The 28 people are meeting every day, every night as a group at the church. Pastor looks at them and says, why are you doing it this way? He says, why don't we do this? Let's go to one meeting on Sunday. It'll be a great one, one big meeting. And he said, every, let's start something in the neighborhood on Monday night. And he said, we'll all come. And as you walk to the meeting at this one person's house, you invite everybody you see. Well, that's what they did. Pretty soon, the meeting was so big, they had to start one on Tuesday night. Then Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, multiple meetings on every night because there were over, in four years, there were over 800 of them. After the four years, they started saying, why don't we start another church? They started six. Two of them have now over 2,000 people in attendance on a Sunday morning. All because they did what? They got out in their community. They started inviting people to join them in their community that's how we grow that's how every church grows it won't happen right here i hope this is fantastic every sunday morning i hard <laughs> and say bob give us the best every week i push myself hard every week to say i've got to be in the word and i've got to be studying i got to be praying i got to have god on me but guys this isn't it you are it you are you available jesus prays for all believers 20 through 26 and we're done here i do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one as you father are in me and i in you that we may be one in us and the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me i have given them that they may be just as we are one I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, have loved them, and have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you have sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love which you love me may be in them and I in them. Jesus prays for all believers, first of all, that they would be one. He wants us to be united in purpose, in love, and in action. And he compares us in the New Testament at least to three specific things. Here's one. We are a family that you wish you had. Okay, nobody got that. Okay. Sometimes the family we get isn't the family we really wish we had. We wish we had a little different family. So, But this should be a family that you always wished you had. Some of you have wonderful families, and I'm just kidding about that. But I'm just saying, if, if you've not had a great family experience, this should be your great family experience. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, you now have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. That's from 1 Peter 1.22. A pastor talked about a story of walking into his home and seeing one of his daughters sitting on the floor with a large pile of unrolled toilet paper in an inc intricate fashion on the floor. She'd been busy just spinning it off <laughs> her finger until it all just made a big pile on the floor. And he said, what in the world are you doing? Brutally honest, she said, I'm unrolling the toilet paper. He said, why are you being naughty? Her father said, or she said back to him, 
because nobody helps me to be good. That's kind of our cry, isn't it? That's what the church is for. It's for people to help you be good. We need each other. We're left alone. Not always a good thing. It's a great thing to be in the family of God, though, and have a brother or sister come alongside you. Say, I'm here. I want to help you. That's all our believers. We're a fellowship. The word in Greek is koinonia. It's usually describing a business partnership relationship. In spiritual terms, it means the Christian community who share the struggle and the triumphs of living the life together. It's a fellowship. Like the fellowship of the ring. If you ever watch those movies? Have you ever watched the... I'm the only one. Okay. <laughs> Lord of the Ring movies. That little group that carried the ring from where it was all the way back to its source so that it could be... I won't tell you the end of the movie. But uh, the ones that did that, there's three whole movies you get to watch that are about two and a half hours long each. But anyway... That whole little group went through a lot of hardships together. It forged their relationship to one another. That's what he's saying, and we're a body. Like the members, it tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, just as a body, though one has many parts, all of its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. We are all baptized in one, and we form one body, whether Gentiles or Jews, slave or free. We are all given one spirit to drink. You know, everybody has something they're supposed to be doing in the body of Christ. I don't know what it is that you have, but you're supposed to be exercising your gifts so that the whole body is blessed. That the world might believe in you. That's when they come together in perfection. One of the things I like about band, I used to play in an instrumental high school band, junior high band. What I loved about band was the fact that we did something, each of us individually, and we made something cool. We made something great. When everyone did exactly what they're supposed to do, it's beautiful. And that's what he's saying about us in the church, that it makes something beautiful the community can't ignore. And then he tells us something else. He tells us he wants us to be loved. He, we are loved by God the same way God loved him. I have a video. Do I have a video? We'll play it. Loudly. There we go. Anybody know what that was? Niagara Falls. A lot of water flows over that thing, huh? You know that that water represents God's love. It's infinite. I don't know if you can get your mind around it, and that's why I showed the video. <laughs> Think about Niagara Falls, how it just keeps flowing and flowing and flowing and flowing with thousands and millions and millions of gallons of water. That's His love. It's infinite. It's eternal. It doesn't ever stop. It goes on and on and on and on. I, the Lord, do not change. If he doesn't change, he can't stop loving. If he wants to. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And lastly, it's perfect. He loves perfectly. I wish I could say that. I can't say that about me. We don't love perfectly. One of the reasons relationships and 50% of all marriages in America end in divorce. Why? Because people don't love perfectly. We don't know how to love perfectly. Most of us haven't been educated about how to love perfectly, but God loves perfectly. That means he does exactly what needs to be done when it needs to be done to the exact degree it needs to be done. That's how he does it. He's perfect. 
in his love. We over-discipline our children. We under-discipline our children. We don't love our children perfectly. We try, but we don't do it right. God loves his children perfectly. And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And the reason is that they behold his glory for ever i'm going to end us there because i know we're over time but i want you to know something that god loves you so much he sent his son for you cares for you i'm we're going to pray in a moment and i'm going to ask you if you've never put your faith in jesus christ and you'd like to do that this morning would you come as as uh, we have the worship band come up and then as they sing this last song if you want to come forward and pray with one of us if you just want to come pray by yourself, if you want to pray in your pew, that's okay too. But God wants to meet you. He wants you to turn to him. He already knows you. <laughs> he wants you to come meet him while he's waiting for you. He can heal your heart. He can mend your wounds. He can change your situation like that. God does that thing. You know why? Because he changes us, and all of a sudden the situation is a whole lot different because he changed us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we have to be able to come to a place of decision where you ask us to make a move towards you. You've told us, Lord, that if we're ashamed to confess you before men, that you won't confess us before your Father who is in heaven. Lord, you call us out publicly because, Lord, it's up to us to be able to tell the public of who you are. Lord, help us this, this, this morning as we come to this time of decision that if there are decisions that people need to make, that you'll move in their hearts, whether it's to join our church, whether it's to be surrendered to your will on a daily basis, whether it's to give their heart to you for the very first time, whether it's, Lord, to come back to you after years of wandering. We pray, Lord, that you move in everyone's heart this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thus, as we sing. You give life. You are love. You bring light to darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord and all the earth will 
shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great. I was just going to tell you, would you be praying for that legislation? It's, it's, it's passed through the House. I don't think the Senate hasn't taken it up yet, right? They haven't voted on it yet, S but they, they will. And so just pray. Um, I mean, I pray against the legislation, uh, but you know what? I just want God's will to be done, no matter what. I think inevitably our country is in a downward spiral at this point. I don't know how long it'll go, but, you know, God's, God's in control. And so that's, that's just how I pray. I've asked Brother Dan to pray for us as we're dismissed today. So, Thank you, worship band. Great message. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for loving us first. Thank you for sending your son uh, that we can have life in him. Uh, Lord, I pray for each of us that we'll be faithful available and teachable and uh, Lord that we may share our testimonies to a lost and dying world uh, be with each of us as we leave uh, protect us guide us direct us we pray in Jesus name amen